Miracles are coming, brothers and sisters. Nobody would even think about some of these guys. They're both working for the devil. You'd be branded as like conspiracy theorist or something like this. This will be the mindset of the fallen Protestant churches. And this is exactly the succession, how things are going to take place. This is what causes the dramatic shift. Just reading that, it just gives me chills. Now you can see the cause for why people hate these people so much. They already started to make religious enforcement. Welcome everyone to another episode of Truth Matters, here with Matthew Shanche and Mackenzie Drebit, where today we tackle the next phase of unification of church and state in America and um, look at the issues that are before us uh, for this coming false worship system that we're trying to cover in great detail. And in the last episode, if you guys remember, we were going over that three-part union between the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So now we're going to head into what those are going to do in order to enforce this mark of the beast and these and the, the tools they're going to use to enforce those things, also known as the miracles that he was talking about. Yep, and um, we have already noticed the impact of this information has been detrimental to our channel, right, Mackenzie? Yes. <laughs> uh, we've noticed uh, that uh, the algorithms are changing or something because we've noticed that fewer people are, it's reaching fewer people, and all of a sudden it's its dropped off. So uh, we're grateful for all of those who are watching, and it really means that it's, it's in your hands now to comment and share and subscribe because uh, the algorithms, especially here in Canada, are look like they're going to be changing, uh, not for our benefit. Um, so they're trying to stop the spread of this information, and it makes sense because we're trying to uncover the very specifics and the mechanisms which which they're going to use to uh, bring the system about. We even noticed in the comments, well, how does uh, America uh, unite church and state? It just isn't going to happen, you know, by accident. And so we are going to go into that more today and understand that the the more detail we share about these things, uh, the less the powers that be are going to like it, and the less the dragon is going to like it. So uh, please pray yep. for us and and please share and subscribe uh, to help the channel and to get this information out there. And go to adtv.watch too, because that is even if something happens or we can't post certain episodes on YouTube, they're going to be going to our adtv.watch site. And that is our own platform that they can, at least for the time being, not affect that so much. Uh, but like Matt was saying, you know, they're talking about Bill C-11 in Canada. And uh, right after uh, our last podcast, our views started going way down. People stopped getting notified, uh, even who were subscribed and who had the bell notification icon. So make sure you check for new videos. Go to adtv.watch and uh, we'll continue now. Yeah. So we looked at the three real identities and we've kind of gone ad nauseum in this, but let's just touch on it. The the three powers that we're supposed to focus on are the dragon, who's the main power behind everything, Satan, uh, the beast, uh, which is Papal Rome, which we looked at. That's a Protestant doctrine, not an Adventist doctrine. And then the last episode was really looking deeply at why we can be sure the false prophet is fallen American Protestantism, or we'll call them apostate Protestantism. And these three are always connected when in discussing through the Bible, uh, discussing the end time record. And we see that they're mainly connected by one key mechanism, and that is the mechanism of miracles. So uh, people who are watching and saying, oh, well, there's not going to be uh, unification of church and state. You're right. By means of normal governmental evolution or societal evolution, that would not happen. But that's why the Bible tells us. It looks too divided right now. And I can see why people are wondering how that's going to take place. But this is going to be one of the main driving factors Miracles will be the difference maker. And so we want to start pulling a, apart what that looks like. And in order to do that, um, we're going to kind of go through uh, biblically today how we can arrive at this these conclusions that, that miracles will drive American Protestantism to have enough power that they can create uh, what they call the image of the beast 
in the United States, which leads to the mark of the beast. You can't have the mark without the image being set up. Yeah. So when we look at this threefold union, there's a hierarchy of responsibility. Why does the dragon need the false prophet and the beast to begin with? And we start to see that this hierarchy of power is all there to get the dragon, Satan's end goal in place, which is a false, a global false worship system or a one world system. So the false prophet's role is to just get the power of the first beast, so to get the power of church and state, and then once it does, it creates the image. Then once the image is created, the wound of the papacy is healed, and then once the papacy has that wound healed, it says in Revelation 13, 3, I believe, that then it makes everybody worship the dragon. So you see, the false prophet gives power back to the first beast, and the first beast then gives power and makes everyone worship uh, Satan. So the, the, the hierarchy is none of the other two pieces, the beast and the dragon, can happen until the false prophet does its job, right? And that job is to get all the power of the first beast before it and then create this image. And so those are the next two main prophetic happenings that we should see. Yeah, that succession is really important for people to understand because, you know, there's a lot of talk about World Economic Forum, New World Order, the United Nations, and all those are very relevant. And we should be aware of all those things happening. But the closer we see those, we can't forget the succession because that's actually the last piece to the puzzle. It's not the first piece. The first piece is that America has to set up this false system of worship, and then that is going to spread globally, and then we have the full new world order actually taking place. And that's what is happening biblically. So we've talked about that a little bit before, and now we're going to show how these miracles play into that switch from a very secular or atheistic America to going back to God as they would like you to see it. But it ended up that it's going to be a false God. It's going to be the dragon. Yeah, and how much of the world, Mackenzie, is like over the last, you know, 10, 15, 20 plus years that we've been looking and diving into these things uh, individually, I've seen in pretty much all the different corners of the conspiratorial world, everyone kind of seems to see this one world government coming, yeah. right? But they don't usually have the um, details about how it could come together. And so that's why World Economic Forum and Bill Gates and you and, and like all these lightning rod people. And what I mean by that is they take the public attention and they take the strike so that you don't pay attention to what's going on behind the scenes that they, they assign all these people as maybe the key mechanisms to getting this one world system. And the Bible clearly shows that the final state of the world is very much a one world system. So it's, it's kind of interesting to me to see that people have known and can kind of see this coming, but they don't realize the mechanisms by which and the, and the, the kind of the outcome that will occur to get to this this one world system. And I'll say that the Bible basically says it's one mind at the end. And we're going to look at that here in a second. Yeah, it's, it's really like, um, you know, if we talked 20 years ago about some of these things, nobody would even think about some of these guys like World Economic Forum as being bad guys or anything like that. It would be just totally, you'd be branded as like conspiracy theorist or something like this. And uh, now people are seeing some of these entities. But what I find interesting is that it's really like they're, they're making these fronts that are easy villains. So it's easy to poke mm -hmm. at, you know, Klaus Schwab, or it's easy to poke at Bill Gates when you don't like some of the things that they're doing with almost eugenics, really. But they're mm -hmm. then missing the real push, which is they're pinning each other against the wall, really. You know, oh, this guy's evil, mm -hmm. you know, because he's anti-God and anti-this and anti-everything. Oh, we need God back in the country. So they're, they're pushing, but they're, they're working themselves to the end goal that they're actually looking for. And what we're seeing here is what, like, taking the interpretation out of our hands or out of, the, you know, the general public's hands and placing it in the hands of the Bible— and so we go to Revelation 17 to see what the Bible describes as the st end state of the world 
and uh, we'll see John taken in vision to see what the Bible is going to describe is this final power that uh, creates this one world system. So let's read Revelation 17. First, we'll read 3 to 6. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. So John's having a vision here. And I saw a woman, which we've seen represents a church, sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Now, before we kind of go forward, I want to point out some things that we're seeing in these first verses, three through six. We see the woman here isn't God's true church, that the woman here, as you said in the, in the previous episodes, that there it can also be the fallen church, right? And so we have a pure woman and a, and a defiled woman. And here we're describing the defiled woman. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not uh, as we've seen her in the past. Now she's almost reached this this fullness of maturity, this scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemies. So that gives us part of the definition of how we could find out who this, you know, power is in the real world. When we understand the definition of blasphemies, and one of those, the, the, the key identifier is claiming to be able to forgive sins, right? So that's, that's blasphemous. And there's only one organization on planet Earth right now that says they can forgive sin uh, by their own power. Um, so that's a, another key indicator that kind of keeps us on the track of understanding who this is. Having seven heads and ten horns, which harkens back to other language we've seen in, in the book of Daniel, right? And in other places in, in Revelation. Revelation 12, I think, also has a, a reference to this. And then we see the woman again arrayed in purple and scarlet. We covered in previous episodes in the Climate Commandments one uh, that, you know, these colors are are representative of, uh, you know, important things in God's kingdom, the purple and the scarlet, the scarlet's blood, the sacrifice, the purple's royalty, but you never see the blue, which is obedience to God's law. And so we see, we see here the purple and the scarlet are, are very popular colors within the papal system and within the daughter churches of the Protestant churches. They're decked in gold and precious stones and pearls. When you look at the, the properties of the Catholic Church, uh, they're, they're the most magnificent properties in the world, really, decked in, the, in these types of fine stones and materials. And uh, her cup filled with abominations and filthiness and fornications. And so number five, uh, Reve Revelation 17, 5 says that this is the final system by the, by the Bible's uh, view is called Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother. And I'll just stop there, the mother of harlots, but she's the mother. So this Babylon system, it's hearkening back all the way through the kingdoms of the earth, which we know in Daniel's Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and saying that this is really just the mature woman who has matured through all these ages to create this final synthesis system of all of these things. Yeah, and if I can just jump in there, when we look at the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and golden precious stones and having a golden cup in her hand. I believe I mentioned this before, but when you go to the Vatican, they have a statue on the side. It's a big statue and it's a woman holding a cup in her hand with a serpent there and standing on the Bible. If they are not telling you straightforward that this in Revelation 17 is themselves, then you, you're you either blind or three days dead because it is so obvious. They accept it themselves, who it is. They're giving you the representation of the Bible at their main location for you to see, and people still have trouble accepting it or understanding it. Yeah, these are all elements the Bible says prove all things. We're piecing this together the puzzle here. And we see that the what do they do? What's this final beast system do? It's described it in, in verses 3 through 5. But verse 6, Revelation 17, 6, tells us what this beast system, this final 
bla uh, blaspheming Babylon, the great mother of harlot system, does. Revelation 17, 6 says, and they was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So we see that it's a persecuting, violent uh, power. And when you go back and look at who has drunk with the blood of the saints uh, for that, 17, that 1260 years of papal persecution, um, that again fits the papal system, but it actually extends more than the papacy at this point. It's embodying all the uh, religious systems of the earth at this point. Now we're going to continue on into Revelation 12, skip a little bit ahead, Revelation 17, verse 12 through 14. Just to kind of show you what the Bible says, you know, we say, oh, the, the world's going to end in one system. Well, does the Bible say that? Well, let's take a look. It said, and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. And then says, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast, and these shall make war with the lamb. Now that is perfectly consistent. We see the ten horns are ten kings. So you don't need to speculate about what the ten horns are when you're looking at these things, right? And you see these ten kings are going to receive power with the beast for a short period of time. It says one hour. So it's going to be a short period of time. And then it says at this point, they all have one mind because they've given all their strength and power to the beast. And what do they do? They're going to make war with the lamb which is perfectly consistent with Revelation 17, uh, 12, 17, which we've looked at before, where it says the dragon was wroth with the woman, so Satan is angry with the church and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, and then it defines who the remnant is. They keep the commandments of God, and they have the testimony of Jesus. So I want to give a, a quote here uh, in a second about Ellen White uh, writing about this exact uh, verse, what talks about one mind. Yeah, some people might have a question at, at this verse in verse 12 uh, because it says that for one hour. Some people take that as prophetic, but I just want to qualify that. Uh, in Revelation 10 and 11, it talks that there is no time prophecies after 1844. So we're this time frame here is after that fact. So this hour, if you actually look at the definition, just means a short but indefinite amount of time. So this isn't a prophetic time. It's just saying, it's like we would say, um, you know, it's only going to take like an hour or something. You know, some, it's an expression that's used to mean a short, or we will say, oh, it'll only take a minute. But it's not literally a minute. You know, it might take five minutes, six minutes, ten minutes. But you use it as an expression. So that's how it's being used here. I just wanted to point that out. Absolutely. And so when when this final system does occur uh, and these groups of, of powers all come together to unite in one system, there's not much time left in Earth history. Right. So if you have anything to take away from that is that time is very short uh, once this unification occurs. And it's in part because this group of people seeks to just uh, make war with the Lamb. And so they're, they're going to go on a full-on offensive against those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Yeah, God is not going to let them have their cake and eat it too. That they get their system and they're just now going to have a heyday for the next, you know, hundreds of years. That's not going to be the case. God has order and he has a plan and he's the one with the playbook. So he is allowing and not allowing things to happen in the time that he sees fit. Yeah, and to just say one last thing, it's all in an effort to save every single person possible. So he allows Satan to do things to get those who are going to be saved to, into the yeah. situations that will allow them to have the character development needed. Now, I think God would rather us not have to have these things, but unfortunately in our fallen states, sometimes... The, the crisis is what causes the the action within our hearts and minds to really get moving. And so um, we see God allows these things, and he's going to allow this one world system. And when this system comes and they have one mind, uh, let's see what uh, this, this passage has to say about this so it can define it a little bit better for us. These have one mind. There will be a universal bond of union, one great harmony, a confederacy of Satan's forces, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. 
Thus is manifested the same arbitrary oppressive power against religious liberty, freedom to worship God according to the dictates of conscience, as was manifested by the papacy, when in the past it persecuted those who dared to refuse to conform with the religious rites and ceremonies of Romanism. So it's it's kind of just painting the picture here. There will be a universal bond, one great harmony of Satan's forces. So uh, it's it's is that confirming to us this notion that there will be a one world system, a new world order in the future? A hundred percent. And the interesting thing about this quote, it's from the 1890s. And if you look in history, into American history specifically, you'll see in 1888, they already started to make religious enforcement. It was rescinded, but that's why already back in the 1800s, they're talking about this because this was a reality and they could see that this is going to happen soon again, but it's going to be spread because the Bible says that it's going to end up being global. But if you think that this hasn't happened before, it has happened before, and it's still on the books, you can look it up under blue laws. And uh, this is going to be coming soon again. Mm -hmm. And it will have the same arbitrary, oppressive power yep. of Rome before it, which is exactly what Revelation 13 says. The, the second beast will get all the power of the first beast before it, which is this arbitrary, oppressive power against religious liberty and against freedom of conscience, really is what it comes down to. So let's clarify, though, because there are people out there say, yeah, I knew this one world system was coming and that there would be this universal confederacy almost. But they often forget that the image of the beast, in order for any of this to happen, the one mind, to, in order for that to occur, there needs to first be an image of the beast formed, right? It cannot happen elsewhere until America does its job. So where does the image of the beast get formed? Is it globally or is it locally in America first? It's locally in America first. America is going to be the front leader. That's exactly what we, we, we find is, is the case. And we know that because according to the Bible, the image of the beast comes exclusively from the second beast of Revelation 13. And because you and I have covered this, we know that a beast is a kingdom. So it means that the second beast, it, it must happen in the territory of the kingdom that it represents, right? So what kingdom is that? It's America, because we've already looked at that at length. So we know there's a religious battle coming because the image of the beast has to be set up in America, and that image is the unification of church and state. Now, I'd like to read a couple more passages from Ellen White's writings that kind of cover this same concept, just so we're not, we're not making this up. Uh, it says, As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy, enforcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, which we're going to cover in great detail in uh, uh, the next episode. The people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. So we see here, America first, uniting with the papacy, then the rest of the world follows. Here's another one. Foreign nations will follow the example of the United States. Though she leads out, yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of the world. So America first, then the rest of the world. It's very interesting how right now there's a lot of people, um, I would call them, I don't know, false flags maybe or distractions, but we see... Uh, people talking about China, that China is going to be, you know, the next big power and all these things. And we're talking about World War III possibilities with all the things that are happening everywhere. And the biblical narrative doesn't support China being the next world power. And that's a very interesting thought for people who think that that could be the case. But we know that won't be the case biblically. Now, that doesn't mean that other powers in the world don't have play. But the Bible focuses on this dragon, beast, and false prophet because that is the one that's actually going to be creating this new world order that's going to be making a false worship away from God onto something else. And 
China is not going to be that one as much as it uh, can appear that it is giving threats or that America is playing this this game back and forth. And it's uh, important for us to know that so we don't get swayed by every wind of doctrine, right? Every world event that happens, and I saw a lot of the Protestant world at the start of the Ukrainian-Russian conflict assigning these prophetic Gog and yep. Magog roles to Russia and uh, auxiliary powers trying to make everything fit into yeah. this um, prophetic narrative. And our goal is to not uh, like try to assign everything so it fits so we can keep people interested. We're surely just trying to tell the truth the best we know it. And even if people don't agree with it, they can at least hear the perspective and understand why we believe what we believe and can use that to compare and contrast to what other people are offering as as truth. But as we're looking at this right now, in, in an American perspective, and I want people to to realize, I saw some commenters being like, well, these, you know, they're not even American. They're just trying to bash on America. I am an American citizen. I spent uh, the first 35 years of my life <laughs> in America uh, living in Illinois, and then I lived in Los Angeles for about uh, 13 years, and then I moved up to Canada. I've only been here three or four years, right? So this is not like two Canadians like <laughs> bashing on America, and it's not like we also have glowing reviews of Trudeau and Christia Freeland and all of these World Economic Forum grads, so to speak. So we're, we're equal in uh, shedding light on wherever light needs to be shown for the truth to be told. This is not a America bashing session, uh, we're just simply stating the, the the case and the facts the way they are. So I hope people can can appreciate the angle we're coming from here with that. So um, I want to kind of take a look at the current state of America today, because here we are saying, oh, it's America, it's going to be religious, it's going to be, uh, you know, this image of the beast is United Church and State System, and how the heck does all this happen? Because when we look at America today, you wouldn't think that it would be possible for them to make a national religious law where the church is essentially running the government. Um, because, and then we covered this in previous episodes, where we talked about a Hegelian dialectic, right? Yeah. Where you see two opposing forces put out into the world and they rub against each other and push against each other to create a synthesis of ideologies that creates the, the the desired outcome. And I think what we're witnessing is maybe the greatest, most powerful Hegelian conflict that has ever occurred. Yep, I, I totally agree. We see this opposition right now where you have the one side going against the other side and you can just look up um, or you can see it. You don't even have to look anything up on the news, all the different churches talking about the different opposition to both sides and they're all pushing against each other and it's just going to bring into one synthesis of exactly what they're going for unfortunately yeah and so the two pieces that are pushing against each other are the political secular left versus the political religious right and these two powers are like fighting for the minds of the people in america right now and so we're going to kind of point to this because we have, we can thank the um, French Revolution for our two-party system that we have, and we'll find out that the end they're both working for the devil. In in the end, now again, we're not condemning individuals in there, but we're just simply pointing out that if the world gets to one mind and the United States is the catalyst for it, uh, the political parties in America are going to be a main uh, catalyst to getting this all accomplished. So the left secular ideology versus the right religious ideology are, are clashing against each other, and it's manifesting itself in, in this way. Let's take a look. As of right now, the current state of American spirituality and, and the churches in America is not looking good. Here's an article called The Collapse of Faith in America, and I'm going to just read through this quickly. It says, once upon a time, the United States was known as a, quote, Christian nation, but now our country is moving away from those roots at a pace that is absolutely breathtaking. In 1972, a Pew study found that 92% of all Americans identified as Christians. But the most recent Pew survey that asked this question discovered that only 63% of Americans still identify as Christians at this point. At one time, virtually every nation in the Western world was heavily Christian. 
but now most of them have been transformed into post-Christian societies. This is the effect of the secular left, right? Pushing on the uh, ideology here and, and changing even a Christian into becoming, uh, let's just say, a, a, not a real Christian. They don't take the Bible to be the literal word of God and they don't um, uh, practice uh, the, the biblical faith. It could be argued that the United States is already there as well. And one recent survey found that most parents do not consider it to be important to pass their faith onto their children. It says parents place less importance on their children growing up to have religious or political beliefs that are similar to their own. About a third, 35%, 35% say it is extremely or very important to them that their children share their religious beliefs. And 16% say the same about their children's political beliefs says, sadly, many Americans simply do not care. Our nation is choosing to reject faith like never before, and right now there are no indications that this is going to turn around anytime soon. But they don't know well, the full story. Well, that's an interesting perspective. <laughs> exactly, right? So from, the, from an outsider's perspective, as they're writing this, they're like, wow, the collapse of Christianity America seems all but certain it's happening around us. But in there, he's also kind of alluding to the fact that like with the decay of Christianity is becoming the decay of society with it, right? And this is the push. The uber, uber liberal agenda will ultimately lead to a despotism of morality. And like there's, it, it'll be completely void of all these, these types of things. Like in it, for instance, not being able to define what a woman is. That's the, the uber uh, left version of where things are going. And you'll see that it'll, you'll, you'll, we'll have a pushback from the religious right, which we'll see here in a second. So now let's take a look at another article. This is from The Guardian. Uh, it's talking about churches closing. Churches are closing at rapid numbers in the U.S. Researchers say as congregations dwindle across the country and a younger generation of Americans abandon Christianity altogether, even as faith continues to dominate American politics. About 4,500 Protestant churches closed in 2019, the last year data is available, with about 3,000 new churches opening, according to LifeWay Research. It was the first time the number of churches in the U.S. hadn't grown since the evangelical firm started studying the topic in 2014. With the pandemic speeding up a broader trend of Americans turning away from Christianity, researchers say the closures will only have accelerated. In the last three years, all signs are pointing to a continued pace of closures probably similar to 2019 or possibly higher, as there has been a really rapid rise in American individuals who say they are not religious. Okay, Mackenzie, so we're seeing here that there's like churches are closing. Parents are not looking to instill biblical values into their children. Uh, Christians are, are fewer people are identifying as Christian. Uh, all of these things would kind of seem to show that there is an accelerating trend reshaping U.S. religious thought, and it's going in the wrong direction uh, uh, in, in terms of like. Christianity rising and creating church state unification. I mean, looking at the current state of things, you'd be like, okay, well, it's not only that's not going to happen, the exact opposite seems to be happening, right? But this is this is Hegelianism because we actually have a flip side of that. The, the opposing force to this church is closing and morals falling and, you know, people not identifying with the, the God of the Bible anymore in this new I won't even call, I guess I shouldn't call it new, but this now coined term called Christian nationalism. Yeah. And right now, a lot of the mainstream media is looking at this Christian nationalist movement and saying, watch out. Here are just a couple of headlines from the last few weeks. Christian nationalism, a threat to democracy. Christian nationalism is the single biggest threat to America's religious freedoms. Christian nationalism is a danger to our nation. Okay, so here are the two ideologies. We have this falling Christian mindset being met with the rise of this Christian nationalist 
uh, it seems like a small group of people now, and they generally associate it with white evangelical Christians. And you see that it's a small but loud and fervent group, very passionate, right? And they're, they're just starting to push against each other, and a drastic shift is coming. Yeah, and this is actually not a new thing. This is something that's been going on for well over 150 years, actually. They're, you can see how they, they change terms. Like the 2030 agenda is just a new term for the same agenda that was happening in the 90s. And this Christian nationalism is actually just uh, a change or retitling of the national reform movement, which started in the 1800s, which was connected to America putting laws uh, regarding worship. So this is something that has been coming down the line for quite some time, and it's gaining speed as the left pushes, then the right gets harder, and they're actually able to butt those up together much stronger because you have this, this opposition taking place. And when we see these two forces pushing against each other, someone's going to say, well, it, it certainly seems that the secular side has way more momentum and power because in America you've got a melting pot of different religions and cultures and backgrounds. And I mean, it's kind of the identity of America where like everyone can come in and, and worship as they choose and believe what they, they, they choose to believe. And that's one of like the, the basis of the, of the beauty of American culture. But the Bible says an image of the beast is coming and that all the power of the first beast will be held by this same second beast, which we've identified as America. So if we're looking at the two opposing forces, which which one makes a Christian, a national Christian religious law? Well, it's America, right? And so the of these two things pushing against each other, even though the secular side seems to have more momentum right now, and the Christian nationalist is like this dangerous movement that people are saying is dangerous right now, Eventually, America makes a Christian national law. So something changes to where Christian nationalism, or some version of it, will be the winner in this, even though right now it's being demonized. And so this is why we're trying so hard to get people to see the Bible records description of what causes this dramatic shift. And we've seen over the last three or four episodes, it's very clear what causes this shift. And, and don't get us wrong, we do not support the radical left side just because we're saying that the right is going to end up enforcing uh, this image of the beast. Right. We're not supporting a side at all. We are only supporting no. freedom side and God's side. And God's side is freedom side, freedom to do religious, whatever it is that you are feeling convicted to do. God doesn't force anybody, and we don't want to be forcing anybody else either. And we've seen people say, oh, you're, you're, you're attacking the right. And then when we talk about the left, oh, we're attacking the left. Both parties, just like the first and second beast, are both Satan's powers. The left and right powers are being used by Satan, both of them being used by him. So we, we don't we don't advocate any political side. We're not interested in politics whatsoever. We're simply interested in the mechanisms that will bring about the image of the beast, which leads to the mark. And we don't want anyone to get that mark. So we're trying our best to help people see the, how the two sides, even though they look apart, are working together to create the synthesis. And we're going to see how here in just a second. Yeah, we don't want people to get um, confused in all the clutter of all the things that are happening in the world. We need to stay focused on the real severe things, which are those things that take our salvation away. Yes, things will take our body, things will take um, our life, but the most important thing is that we don't get caught up with things that is gonna take our, our eternal life. So that's what we're trying to focus on. And now if we go back to Revelation 13, we're going to go back there and see how that ties into what we're just seeing in Revelation 17 with that same power. So if we go to Revelation 13, starting at verse 13, it says, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Verse 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do. So we see that 
they're going to use these great wonders and these miracles and the fire coming down from heaven. And these are very interesting words. We can't just take everything always at face value. But this is, these are really key things to, to note here. Yeah. And, and when people say, like, we saw a comment last time, like, how could how, you guys haven't said how America could get the momentum to make this shift? Well, the Bible tells us he, he here is American Protestantism in Revelation 13, 13. Uh, he does great wonders that he makes fire come down from heaven in the sight of men, which is the, in this, the following verse says, and this is what deceives them. And it was by means of those miracles. So what causes this shift back to religion? Miracles are coming, brothers and sisters. Miracles are coming to the point where it's going to be so convincing that the whole world is caught up and deceived in this. And so we want to break this down because Revelation 13, 13 is really showing us what uh, vehicle is going to be used to cause this dramatic shift back towards specifically Christian religious ideologies. Uh, and we see that this this is confirmed in Revelation 19.20 when it says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them. So make no mistake, the false prophet is going to perform acts of miracles that will change the entire landscape of the world. This is what causes the dramatic shift. There's nothing natural about uh, the, the process of government that ends in the United States uniting church and state. It was the act of deceptive miracles. And so we're going to pull this apart a little bit, and we're going to look at two key words in Revelation 13, 13. The first one is the word wonders. It says, and he doeth great wonders. Well, what does that mean? We've said it's miracles, but let's take the Bible's uh, word for it and how we define these terms. The word wonder used here can be found in your Strong's Concordance, G4592. It's the word semion, and it literally means supernatural miracle. And when we see this word translated in other places in the New Testament, like in the book of John, it's translated not as wonder, but as miracle. Here's an example, John 2.11. This beginning of miracles, the same word that's used as wonders in Revelation 13, did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. So in this other location in the Bible, we see that this miracle is not just describing, you know, some general miracle, but specifically miracles that Jesus is doing, right? So the same word for wonder is being used as the first miracle that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. And what look at what happened when Jesus did the miracle. It says, and his disciples believed on him. So the miracle caused him to uh, show a sign that made his disciples really believe that he was who he said. So these, these miracles are connected to Jesus and people believing. Now, the interesting part about that is later, what did Jesus say about miracles? A wicked and idolatrous nation seeks after miracles. And that is because the devil is going to be able to do miracles too. We shouldn't be looking for miracles right now to prove whether someone or something is right. We need to be seeing, does it align with the Bible? Here a little, there a little. We need to prove it by the word of God, not by how amazing the miracle because it is telling us the false prophet who wrought miracles and that's how he deceived them. So you're looking at this and Jesus said that a wicked and idolatrous nation. Well, what is idolatry? It is worshiping something that is not God. And when it says an image is made, what's another word for an image? An idol. So it's an idol generation and an idol law is going to be put that is going to be deceiving people through the miracles that are taking place. And we need to be aware so that we don't see, oh, they're raising people from the dead. Oh, they're, they're all these things. So these are really things that we need to be paying attention to so that we're not deceived when we see these miracles taking place. Yeah. To the law and to the testimony, if it speaks not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Not some light, not a little bit of light, zero light. So if the miracles occur, but it's not in accordance with the law and the testimony of God, then it doesn't matter how great it looks. 
It cannot be from the true source because God's word doesn't change. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So these are principles that we need to have rooted in us so we don't get overcome by these miracles. I want to give another example because this is going to be the mindset. Remember, everything Satan is doing is trying to create a counterfeit because he knows what's true and he can't make it seem not true. So the best he can do is to create a knockoff version of it so you think that one's true rather than the real one, right? And so this is same thing is kind of reflected in, in seeing that Revelation 13, 13, the wonders are miracles defined as miracles in other places in the New Testament. Let's look at John 3, verse 2. It says, The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, Master, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. This will be the mindset of the fallen Protestant churches. They're going to say, we have proof that God's with us because look at the miracles. And it says, no one can do these miracles except God be with him. And this is going to be the basis of the counterfeit system because they're going to say the miracles are proof that their God is with them. But it's, it's a lie. So we're seeing here that the word wonder is miracles, and specifically miracles done previously by Jesus, okay? So the miracles that are coming will reflect what Jesus and the apostles did before, and in the next episode, we're going to really go into what that looks like, because this is going to be the key to overcoming and not falling for this final deception. But let's take a look at another uh, piece here in the word fire. And this is the uh, Strong's Concordance, look it up, G4442. It's the word poor, P-U-R, pronounced poor. And this uh, word, fire, you'll notice has a specific uh, prophetic connotation when it's used in prophetic language. And I want to go to a Bible commentator who is not Seventh-day Adventist, uh, he, from the 1700s, his name's John Gill, and he's a his, his Bible commentary is a, a famous Bible commentary. And I want to kind of point out what he wrote about this Revelation 13, 13 verse. It says, and in this single instance is put instead of all others, it being usual with the Jews to express all wonders and miraculous operations by this miracle of Elijah. Remember, Elijah was with the prophet off of the prophets of Baal, and he made fire come down from heaven in the sight of men. And that's what distinguished the difference between Elijah and the false prophets of Baal, was this miraculous fire coming down from heaven. So we have this literal uh, example of what fire would mean, but we also have a spiritual understanding. It says, and this could may also be understood mystically, of the pretensions of the papacy to confer the Holy Ghost and his gifts upon men by breathing on them, which the day of Pentecost were represented by the cloven tongues of fire coming down from heaven. What's interesting about that is the word fire here in Revelation 13, 13 is the same word fire used to describe the Holy Spirit when it came down with uh, on the apostles on the day of Pentecost, where it says in Acts 2, verse 3, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were filled, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began speaking in uh, speaking with others in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here we see in the commentary, it says the Holy Spirit in his gifts and graces is compared to fire because of its purity, light, and heat. It gives them knowledge of divine and spiritual things. So we're seeing here that the fire represents, in a spiritual sense, the Holy Spirit. So when we reread this verse, Revelation 13, 13, it's saying, and great miracles will be done so that the false Holy Spirit comes down from heaven in the sight of men. It's this false Holy Spirit that goes into the apostate Protestant churches that gives them the appearance of miracles, of healings, and other things that we're going to look at later, not today, but later in the next episode, that these, this false Holy Spirit will give them this power in the fallen churches this is what changes the game in America. This is what causes this drastic shift. And what's ironic is they're going to be doing miracles that Jesus did when he first came. 
but he's not coming the first time. He's coming the second time. And we're told very clearly through the Bible that his second coming isn't like his first coming. His first one was like a humble servant, like a man, to be an example. That was his purpose, was to give us that gift of salvation. His second coming is to come as a conquering king, as Michael, as the warrior. He's coming with all the hosts of heaven. It's going to be loud. It's going to be big. It's going to be explosive. And all eyes will see him. And, but the funny thing is, so you can tie this in. Now, the Jews haven't had their Messiah yet because they rejected Jesus. So they're going to see this Messiah coming and these miracles that are like the first coming. And then you can even get all these different groups of people who are looking for these miracles, these signs, these messiahs, whatever, to be coming. And they'll all be satisfied because they have rejected the real Christ. And the, even the Christians don't even know what real Christianity is anymore. So when they see the miracles and this fire that was, that was coming, it reminds me of, uh, you probably remember the, the clip of Benny Hinn, when he goes, fire on the choir, whoa. And it just, and then all the people fall down behind him. And, uh, you know, this is the exact kind of thing we're going to be seeing more and more and more, but even... Uh, more convincing and more dramatic things are going to be going to be taking place. Exactly right, because there's like people will say, well, aren't there's like there's these Pentecostal or uh, uh, charismatic churches that are like touching people and aren't they being healed? Aren't those miracles? These miracles are going to be so powerful and overwhelming that it captivates the whole world's attention. And I want to read another passage this time from the book, The Great Controversy. So let's see what what God is telling us in Revelation thirteen thirteen. So here she says, in those churches which he can bring under his, Satan's, deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing has been poured out. There will be manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. So here we're seeing this is the cause. This is, so he makes fire come down from heaven, the false Holy Spirit, into these false churches, and we see this is what causes great religious interest. Multitudes will exalt that God is working marvelously for them when the work is that of another spirit. Under a religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. So Muslims, Jews, uh, 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 Hindus, Buddhists, this is going to be a Christian-focused battle. The whole world's going to follow. Just reading that, it just gives me chills because to see the deceptiveness and that people are going to think that this is God pouring out his blessing. Oh, it's just, just unbelievable and and terrible. And if it were possible, it's going to be so convincing. It could even deceive the very elect. But the reason the elect are, are um, spared is, isn't because they're special or like they're chosen by God. It's because they read the word of God and they believed it. And they're rooted in it, and they yeah. can't change from it, right? So where, when it says the elect, it's not like placing yourself separately from other people because you're better than them. That's not it. It's a simple faith that you see the word of God, hear it, do it, believe it, and hold on to it. Hold fast to that which is true, right? And so just to kind of s- summarize here, the false prophet will produce miracles by means of a false Holy Spirit. There will be a massive Christian revival in America— brought on by this false Holy Spirit movement that will use miracles as a sign that it's proof that it has divine power. Satan will use these miracles to capture the whole world's attention in preparation for the final deception, which I'll just, we're going to tell you right now, Satan appearing here on earth, pretending to be Jesus. And I'm going to read a, a statement here to kind of summarize this. Fearful sights of a supernatural character will soon be revealed in the heavens in the token of power of the power of miracle working demons. And these references are found in Revelation 13, 14, as well as Revelation 16, 14. They are the spirits of devils go, will go forth to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to fasten them in deception and urge them to unite with Satan in his last struggle against the government of heaven. By these agencies, so so these these miracle working 
whatever's coming, which we're going to touch more in the next episode, are spirits of devils, and they go to the kings of the world and say, you've got to unite. And this is the last push, right? Yep. So it says, by these agencies, rulers and subjects alike will be deceived. Persons will arise pretending to be Christ himself, this is Satan, and claiming the title and worship which belongs to the world's redeemers. So here, listen to this part. They will perform wonderful miracles of healing and profess to have revelations from heaven contradicting the testimonies of the scriptures. So this goes back to what we just said. If it speaks not to the law and to the testimony, it has no light in them. And Jesus spoke about this in Matthew 24. He said there's going to be false Christs and false teachers coming. And when they say, oh, here in the desert, there, go there, that's where he is. Don't go, because this is not Christ. This is false Christs that are coming. And this is exactly the succession, how things are going to take place. We're going to see these miracles. America is going to become a Christian nation again. They're going to start enforcing religious laws. And then we're going to have these false Christs saying, guys, yeah, you, you, you need to be having these laws because it's destroying the planet. It's all these things. God is angry and you need to be honoring and joining with this whole dragon beast and false prophet in the new world order. And these false Christ or this false Christ, which is actually Satan, is going to then completely universalize this image and take it to the entire world. And a lot of Christian theology, modern Christian theology, has this thing called the rapture, right? And so they are expecting the Antichrist to come back and to be the Antichrist and to bring this desolation to the earth, but they don't expect to be part of it. That's yeah. not what we're saying here. We're not saying Antichrist is coming back in the garb of Antichrist. We're saying Satan's coming back in the garb of Jesus Christ. And so that's going to totally throw people with this rapture theology off because not only is everybody here for when the antichrist is here you don't know he's the antichrist because he comes pretending to be jesus and the problem is they they when they come and do all this stuff they're going to pretend that they've changed the scriptures contradicting the testimonies of the scriptures so it's going to be really important to understand why god's word never changes and yeah. i want to read one more great controversy passage before we wrap up here today it says, Satan himself is converted after the modern order of things. He will appear in the character of an angel of light through the agency of spiritualism, which will be the majority of our focus in the next episode. Yep. What is spiritualism and how does it manifest in, in this whole miracle working uh, craziness that's coming? Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and many undeniable wonders will be performed. And as the spirits will profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the institutions of the church, their work will be accepted as the manifestation of divine power. Wow. So when these guys come back, it's going to be saying, here's the Bible. We believe it. You should believe it too. But they're going to manipulate the scriptures in a way that says, well, yes, we're saying the Bible, but we have the authority to change it because here's Satan come back, pretend to be Jesus. And and we're going to look at other people that are going to be coming with him in this uh, whole uh, deception that are going to profess faith in the Bible. And so this is what helps people manifest this comfort in this Christian religious worldview. And people will say, well, you guys are just quoting, uh, you know, other books saying this. What does the Bible say? The Bible record confirms this. Revelation 12, 12. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he has but a short time. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Right So brothers there. and sisters. It, there's, there's no guessing. This is, this, no, there's no guessing. And, and we know that the, the world will be of one mind for one hour or a short period of time. It's at this point that miracles have brought the world together, and these demons that are part of these miracles will convince the kings of the earth to create this one world Christian system. At which point, you know, Satan, and it says when Satan was cast out, his evil angels were cast out with him. So Satan and some of his friends are coming as the final deception, not in the true manner of Christ's second coming, but if you don't know the true manner of Christ's second coming, what is what Satan will do will be more uh, crazy than anything that anyone on earth has ever witnessed. 
that's is that is exactly why we need to be studying we need to know what the second coming looks like we need to know the events taking place because if we don't these miracles just like we read people are going to think oh this is the blessings of god coming this is uh his holy spirit being poured out this is the tongues of fire like was at the day of pentecost we see people being raised people being healed all these great and wonderful things happening even fire coming down from heaven but then it is all going to be because the devil is at work and wow that is just unbelievable and then eventually like we just read he's going to be transformed even into an angel of light and he's going to be beautiful and gorgeous and he's going to look like Christ is here walking among us healing people now imagine that happens to a world that's like not really paying attention to any of this or doesn't know it how one how could you not believe it because it's going to be so overwhelming and so captivating and and will seem so uh un able to not prove like that is it's not true the miracles are going to seem real as we're going to touch on the next one people are going to dead people are going to come back from the dead it's going to seem like and we're going to touch on that in the next episode we're not going to get in that today but in all of this working he's he's trying to deceive you know the whole world and and when he does imagine now there's a small group of people saying wait those are that's not really jesus those people that came back are, are demons those healings are not what they seem to be. Satan made him sick, and then he removes the sickness from them. That's not that's not healing. You know what I mean? And so now you can see the cause for why people hate these people so much. Because these yeah. Jesus supposedly Jesus came back, and you're saying that that's the devil. How dare you? I had a dead loved one come back. Uh, these people were healed that had never walked before. And so it's like when you look at. Uh, how the whole world becomes one confederacy. It's through this means of miracles and Satan coming back and confirming all of these miracles to be really from God. And then ultimately, the reason they hate this small group of people that, that are God's people, that says they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony and faith of Jesus, is because they're pointing these things out still. And I can picture it now, like even loved ones and friends and relatives, you're going to say this stuff too, and they'll hate us for it because it will look like we're hating on things that are so good and meant to bring heaven here on earth. So another key doctrine we're going to need to understand is the millennium because they're going to say the millennium has begun and that's the start of it. And the thing stopping heaven from occurring on earth is this small group of people saying that they're demons and that this is Satan and all this stuff. And that's what gets the whole world charged up to make war with the remnant of her seed as Revelation 12 tells us. And you, you have to join for the next episode where we're going to dive into this spiritualism, these miracles, what is going to be happening, how it is going to deceive almost, it won't, but even if it could, the very elect. Mm -hmm. and we're going to pull apart the pieces to show you how we can prove through the Bible uh, that um, the, the, the state of the dead is going to be a major issue and what this state of the dead, uh, when these people come back, to life, what they're going to tell us when they come back, because they have a special object of their attention when they supposedly come back to life. But as uh, Revelation tells us, at this point, the world is teeming with demons. It's called a habitation of devils and a uh, cage of every hateful and unclean bird, right? And so the whole earth at this point, when that when that verse is being described, is teeming with uh, these, these false uh, spirits. So uh, Mackenzie, uh, I appreciate you walking through these things with me and um, sharing this with, with people because we already see that Google's trying to uh, downplay it. And so it's up to each individual who sees this to share this information with others because even if they don't believe it, it's our job to, to let them know so that they can try to be ready and, and to be able to tell the difference when uh, these things happen. And if you want to see these videos and take notes at certain parts, go to our website, like we said, adtv.watch. You can make bookmarks all through the videos. And then if you have interesting points that you want to share later, you have those saved. You're not going to lose them. And then you can share them with other people. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And let other people know about these things. Start opening your Bible. Start studying for yourself so that you can be a watchman and you not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Thank you for joining us, everybody, and we'll see you in the next one.